ladies and gentlemen. You can start. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first lecture from our data analytics course, which will be titled Intro to Statistical Modeling. My name is Jerzy Baranowski, and I will be your lecturer. Uh, our topics cover a wide area of statistics, starting from mathematical approaches through numerical computation, and we try to attempt it to practical applications. So, uh, without further ado, let's go to start here. I am available on chat now, so if you have any questions or want to say hi, feel free. I will have some information about potential delay in the lecture. I will try to answer any questions as they arise. I will make some pause also for you to ask your questions if you want to. I apologize for a bit of disarray that I am currently that's currently visible in my video. But unfortunately I'm my house is undergoing some renovations so for the next few weeks we will have to work like this. Hopefully it will end soon. Uh, anyway certain organizational information first I would just ask you, uh, can you hear me without problems? Is everything alright? Do I have to adjust any volume or something like that? Please let me know on the chat. I see there are not too many people here, but if anyone wants to chime in about sound will be grateful. Okay, anyway, uh, let's go to the, uh, to the topic, which will be introduction to statistical modeling. First of all, certain organizational aspect considering our course. Uh, the uh, I am available if I'm at AGH. Uh, I'm available if I'm at AGH. I've tried to adjust the noise here. Hopefully it will help. I'm testing new microphones, so this is this might be an issue. Also, there's my dog just behind me, so he might be doing some noise by himself. It's now is it now better? Because I've dropped the volume of of the mic. Coming back to uh, if I'm at the AGH, uh, you can find me in the uh, room C3, uh, in the building C3 in building 200, uh, in building C3 room 214. Well, the problem is that I don't hear the noise, and that's the the main issue that I cannot really adjust for that. And now is there's a bit more. I've tried to modify the the noise uh, the uh, input of the mic even more. Is it now okay? Okay. Uh, so. Uh, as I've said before, uh, you can find me in building C3, room 214, if I'm at AGH, or you can contact me through my email or through MS Teams, preferably through email. Uh, the subject will be graded with the idea of that 50% of the grade will be come from the exam and 50% from the laboratories that will include the and project ending uh, the, the small a very small project to end the uh, end the classes 
uh, in order to pass the laboratory uh, in order to attend to the exam you need to pass the laboratories exam will be in oral form and from what uh, uh, from what I found out yesterday it is quite possible that the oral for, uh, the exam will be in person because at the moment uh, rector's office intends to and uh, to start normal classes in the half of the semester and if the mm, and even if that's not possible they fully intend to make the uh, exam, exam session to be uh, uh, exam session to be in person so uh, we won't be doing it online unless something happens and it's the fourth or fifth wave of the pandemic we will be working on the uh, on the assumption of personal meeting if not personal we will just arrange in groups of two and we'll meet on teams uh, the course materials are available on github you github you already found there are at the moment there are old materials from the last year we will, they will be successfully updated uh, because it was in different uh, classes were prepared in different form previously so there will be some uh, some updates in order to make those exam uh, those materials more relevant to the current course but you can of course look what, uh, at stuff that was being done last year as previously you can make an issue with the uh, for uh, regarding things that you think that are wrong or unclear in the materials then i'll be able to make uh, some corrections for that so feel free to do that that's why the repository is public uh, if someone is interested, this is the course code that was assigned by system syllabus uh, AGH edu -PL. If uh, I'm not sure why such code exists, but if uh, if someone wants to to use it, feel free. I'm not sure what you can use it for, but it's still available in all the documents. If I would be mean, I would require uh, using this code for any communication, but I won't be mean, at least not in this aspect. Uh, the general uh, uh, course outline, which hopefully we'll be able to realize, is starting with this introduction to statistical modeling. Then we uh, discuss the general concepts of Bayesian paradigm. We will discuss what is Monte Carlo computation and how we use it. We will go through simple models and uncertainty modeling. Uh, we go through Bayesian workflow, how to create such models. Then we'll be discussing causality in models. So we'll try to discuss how causal models are being created using directed acyclic graphs. Uh, we will then follow with hierarchical and multi-level models. We'll discuss methods of model checking and we'll fin finalize with modeling of missing data. Uh, last year we, I wasn't able to finish the entire material, but this year I'm hopeful that will be uh, uh, that it will be better. But the la last year it was much more difficult because uh, daycares were closed, so I had to work with my I would stay with my children all the time. Um, so that was a um, very difficult time for preparing new lectures. Okay, uh, we will. Our main source material is the book called Bayesian Data Analysis by Andrew Gelman and co-authors. Uh, this is uh, my. Uh, this is a main. Uh, our main source because of two reasons. First of all, there this uh, well-established book. It's may be slightly outdated in programming details, but it's being fully supported by Professor Aki Vetari from Alto University, you can find the link, but also the main advantage of this book is that this book is free. So you can find this book free on publisher website or at a uh, website of Professor Vetari together with Errata and other stuff like that. So this book is fully free for non-commercial use, so you can have legal access to this book and learn from it, so that's why this is our main uh, main source and it covers most of the materials that we that we will be considering here. Uh, the second book that uh, we can look on is uh, unfortunately not freely available, Statistical Rethinking by Richard McElrath. Uh, this book is uh, a very good book for learning by yourself from the book using R. Uh, however, all the examples are uh, tr were transferred for uh, 
different languages. So everything is available at the website of Professor Makelra. Professor Makelra uh, resides in Germany. He is an he is head of an anthropology department. However, he wrote uh, great books for sta statistics. It's not mathematically heavy. It's a rather uh, nice read that can prepare you for certain aspects of uh, of uh, data analytics, especially in Bayesian uh, parity. Uh, third source material are case studies made by Michael Betancourt, which are freely available at his website. Uh, they are uh, more advanced, but they are also cutting edge because Michael Betancourt is one of the lead developers of STAN. He is a uh, known educator for in uh, statistical methods, especially in uh, uh, frameworks. He has a lo lot of a lot of ideas that were of his were incorporated in the definition of STAN, which will be our main tool for computation. We'll st I'll discuss STAN later. Uh, some of the contents and, uh, that he prepares are available earlier uh, on his Patreon, uh, and which costs five dollars to use. So I, it's interesting. It also provides his podcast with uh, where he interviews some interesting people that are using Bayesian methods, or were influential creators of, for example. Uh, one of, uh, he has an interview with one of the first me uh, creators of, Monte uh, of Hamilton and Monte Carlo method. Uh, but also, s uh, behind the paywall, you have to pay $5 per month to order to use this uh, Patreon. In my opinion, it is worth it, but it is absolutely not necessary for this course. So this is only for your personal uh, education and uh, uh, and description. Of course, as you see, you have links here. Those materials are actually currently available uh, with uh, on, on the GitHub. There are minimal changes that I, I will push later today, like removing the office hours or something like that because of the pandemic. Uh, so uh, there's some extra reading. Uh, there's a good book uh, by Ben Lambert called Student's Guide to Bayesian Statistics. It's a tr slightly different approach to uh, preparation. I This is very recommended book. It's also simply available. He has some YouTube tutorials with it. I personally don't did not find it such ac uh, accessible, but some of my colleagues did, so it might be a good choice for you if or that you want to extend your knowledge. It is not required. If you are interested, read it. As you can see, there is certain pattern here. There are no books in Polish on Bayesian statistics that are worth anything. Also, there are many books on Bayesian statistics that are not worth anything, and I strongly recommend avoiding them. Um, and uh, so, generally, those I recommend might be worth reading. Uh, there is a book called Bayesian Analytics uh, with Python by Osvaldo Martin, who is one of the developers of PyMC3. PyMC3 is uh, one of the Python uh, native uh, packages for statistical computing. Uh, this book is specific because it generally doesn't say you, but requires for you to know what's going on in Bayesian statistics. Because uh, you can uh, get, let's not maybe not let hurt, but uh, you can come to b bad conclusions working that the PyMC free uh, ecosystem is very nicely developed in in Python. However. Uh, they are slightly behind uh, Stan if it depends on the new scientific results. They generally implement the same algorithms, with one exception that uh, PyMC3 allows your computation to include discrete parameters, which is a problem, which we will perhaps discuss on the vector uh, regarding Monte Carlo. Um, and they shouldn't, but they do. N recently, PyMC3 received ma big updates. Uh, based on using JAX for accelerated computation of uh, Python code, so that might be an improvement, but I have not tested that. And, and uh, PyMC3 is based upon the Tiano library for deep learning, because it includes uh, necessary for Bayesian computation uh, automatic differentiation frameworks. Uh, however, Tiano is a specific deep learning uh, f framework which had an issue, a, a period of non being of being non developed. Now it's again revived by PM, PMC three. So it might be kind of interesting. Okay, uh, 
Bayesian statisticians are uh, actually very uh, available and uh, and uh, effective. Uh, uh, I think maybe not effective, but very prominent on uh, social media, especially on Twitter. Generally, on Twitter, you can find a lot of uh, people that are doing science, which you can uh, follow and find interesting stuff. Like so, that especially Professor uh, Vetari, who is very active on Twitter. Uh, Professor Andrew Gelman, author of our main course book, uh, he is less active on Twitter, but he has a very active blog discussing statistical problems, political problems that are modeled with statistics. He was one of the uh, lead experts of the uh, uh, during uh, creating prediction model for uh, American elections on the last last few elections uh, he was working with a team of economic uh, econ uh, of the economist as, as a magazine in the united states uh, of course michael betancourt is very active on twitter and on his own website uh, richard McElrath, author of statistical rethinking also is active and provides interesting exercises or stuff uh, uh, and also it's worth to mention alexander andora uh, who is uh, an author of podcast on Bayesian statistics called Learning Bayesian Statistics. Uh, it is a very good podcast if you want to learn something ab about it, because but it's created most in the form of interviews with people that are doing Bayesian statistics. Alexandra is one of the developers of PyMC3, and th so their focus is also on Python, but they are not technical, they are more on application-based. There are certain issues with this podcast uh, being too a bit gimmicky at the moment, like asking standard questions to uh, uh, to uh, his uh, guests, but his guests are really great, and usually he gets very nice information from them. So I strongly recommend listening to it if you want to, uh, to do it. Uh, there are... Uh, of course, different resources also that you can find. Uh, that Twitter, I think I've declared that to create a Twitter list and I will uh, put it on uh, GitHub. Uh, I might try to do it because I, I've created some time ago uh, a, a Twitter list for Bayesian statistics, but I haven't been updating it for a long time. Uh, but those n those names are interesting, and I strongly recommend following it if you are following them if you are a Twitter user. So, we, after this a bit long introduction, let's come to the point uh, what we are doing here. And we are focusing on Bayesian data anal uh, analysis and statistical modeling. Uh, because generally when you hear data science, this is a very broad field that can encapsulate a lot of things, which could not be covered during one semester, at least not in any reasonable detail. So we will focus on models that are grounded in probability. So those models will have a, a probabilist, uh, probabilistic background for describing the uncertainty that we have on how the model works and what's going on. Uh, moreover, those uh, we want those models to be as interpretable as possible, so we want to know where cer certain predictions or results are coming from. Can we get interpretation of what our model means, what are parameters of our model mean? and what conclusions can we come from those parameters and finally uh, maximal transparency so we know how the model was created where model comes from what is being done with data what is being done with model all those things are being imp are important and advantageous when using bayesian methods in different me uh, if for example machine learning methods we have the issues of uh, reduced transparency and interpretability uh, so what is generally data science? Data science is a very multidisciplinary field. These uh, ideas are one Generally, there are uh, even some broad statements that machine learning is just rebranded statistics or data science is rebranded statistics. It's not essentially that, but in data science, you do a lot of things that are statistically uh, based. There is a lot of things that are just programmatic work that or commu data communication work that are very important however in case of uh, data uh, of uh, stati statistics take a very important role especially that when you look at machine learning models machine learning also can be interpreted as statistics at least with a certain uh, point of view either way 
creating models or solving problems in data science requires you to incorporate domain knowledge uh, to communicate your result you present your resu result to you need to solve problems and you need to investigate them and usually data science is very business related because data science allows you to make decisions and those decisions are generally uh, the uh, those decisions are generally the core of make uh, uh, core of making money and getting somewhere. So that's why data science is important. It is a multidisciplinary field, and data statistical data analy uh, analytics or data mo uh, statistical modeling is a part of it that is significant in certain field. In different fields, it's less uh, is more uh, omitted. Uh, but what we'll try to place what the statistical modeling really is here. So generally the most known comparison of, of, of statistical modeling is that it's being compared or put, uh, put versus to uh, machine learning. Because, however, really the differences are, this is not like that one is certainly better or worse. They are different tools that are similar on many aspects. They are, can be used for solving similar problems. Uh, and uh, they have different strengths. And so that's why when you find, for example, a paper which benchmarks statistical model and machine learning model and one of them comes better, usually such comparison is unfair. It is unfair because there are situations when machine learning models are computationally efficient and gr are great for themselves, like for example, image recognition, statistical models just don't work there. However, uh, whenever you have a lot of data and this data is of good quality, machine learning is great. If you have situations when you don't have... A, and statistical models are bad. Are bad because they're either difficult to construct or are very, uh, are very computationally expensive. On the other hand, there are situations when you have poor quality data, little or very little data, you have to incorporate different aspects to your model, then machine learning fails because you don't really have anything to, le to learn. Uh, your, your neural network or your classifier does not have uh, anything to learn from. And that uh, makes it useless for this application or give you very well, low quality predictions. And then statistical model can shine because they can incorporate knowledge from different sources and can compensate for uncertainty or just give you bounce on your decisions, which is interesting. So statistical models generally incorporate probability in their application. That means that statistical model will allow you to create uh, to uh, will allow you to assign your degree of belief that is uh, in certain aspects of happening. So, for example, you can incorporate where in your expectation, your expert knowledge, or your general earlier studies, for example, where the parameters lie, and then you can assign probability of being uh, of those parameters locating them somewhere. And you can also using statistical models, you can create prediction, and with that prediction you can put confidence intervals that will say you, okay, our mean expectation is that certain value will be like this, but on for 90-95% it will be located in this interval. And that can be used together with uh, different uh, uh, aspects. It can be, uh, for example, joint with decision making when you can assign a cost for a decision decision that made upon a prediction and then having uncertainty in your prediction you can propagate to into uncertainty to your uh, cost of making decisions so you can expect how probable is that you lose on your decision and how probable it's, it's will gain based on this probability so that's why probability models are very useful especially in business situations but not only that uh, moreover uh, we uh, in the aspect of uh, statistical models we also very often consider data generation because as I said usually in statistical models we don't have high quality data 
not having quite quality data creates a situation where we have the uh, we have to consider how this data is being disturbed, why the quality is low. So our models require from us to get where uh, how, how the data was created, how the data was collected. So in order to do so, what is the relation between underlying phenomena and observed values. In statistical models, we look for interpretability. So, as I said, we want to know why certain decisions, certain predictions will be made. What those parameters mean? What we can infer from the values of the parameters? Usually, but not always, statistical models are some kind of regression-based. So, uh, we our models are based on some kind of uh, regressive models of fit of certain values to something else. But we are not limited to linear because statistical models uh, only in classical results that we wanted analytical results needed linear regression or something like that. Now, with numerical computation, with Monte Carlo computation, you are generally... it's generally uh, can do as complicated model as you want, however, there are com might be computational bottlenecks that we'll come to. Uh, on uh, the machine learning side, well, we have advantages of not needing actually initial structure of uh, additivity of regression uh, formulation uh, we uh, don't have traditional parameters that need to be interpretable or can be interpretable you have weights for example of neural networks or you have uh, divisions on uh, card tree no uh, nodes or you have uh, random forests with very with parameters that are absolutely not interpretable from uh, like number of trees or uh, other uh, aspects. Uh, usually machine learning models do not need you to focus on single variable. It doesn't directly model the process that you are interested in but learns from the data. It is kind of a model but this model is does not incorporate the knowledge about the process it just incorporates the data relationships, which for certain aspects is very useful because, for example, for aspects of uh, image recognition, we do not have the model at all. We need to capture patterns, but we really do not know how, uh, how it works. And machine learning models do not rely on additivity, which is popular in statistical models, because statistical models, we need to kind of separate certain aspects, and addition is very useful for that. And in machine learning, we do not have that structural relationships that require additivity. Well, advantages, uh, as I said, machine learning can be very advantageous in comparison to uh, statistical models, especially in a situation when we do not have models, we do not have expert knowledge that we can use, we are not interested in creating a causal relationship, causal model. If we want to do a classifier or uh, some kind of predictor that we are also only interested in values. We have a lot of data that have high signal-to-noise ratios. High signal-to-noise ratio means that our signal is so strong that uh, the, uh, that the, uh, noi uh, the noise is uh, tiny in comparison to it. Uh, this is especially visible, in, for example, in visual or sound recognition. When we have image, the image, even if it's blurry, still has a structure. So you can see that structure and get from that a uh, lot of information. And uh, uh, this is similar with sound that we can extract the structure of words from even the noisy, uh, noisy sound and then uh, we can create some kind of model that will work on that. Language trans uh, translation or uh, language correction where you have the words that are really not very noisy because noise in the text is like typos or interpunction and those are things that are not really significant difference but in comparison to the entire structure of document. So the, sig the text that is in the document is a very strong signal in comparison to noise that is possible. However, uh, uh, machine learning is a much uh, more black box approach, so we really don't need to have the no knowledge to use it, which is might be advantages, especially if you want to do so something quickly or you really don't have any other options regarding no knowing what's going on. 
and it's efficient for large data sets with multiple number of features because generally it can handle a lot of data because if you don't need to create model creating relationships from that situation then you have the uh, a lot of advantage. However, if the data is low quality, then the problem starts. But if data is low quality, then you really need to have to compensate for that quality, with some, usually with some kind of additional knowledge, additional models. Uh, so, uh, what are the advantages of uh, statistical models? Well, they handle small data sets much better. Because you can Knowing something about uncertainty and data collection process, even of small data sets, you can still get a lot of information about what kind of predictions you can get from, from the data. If you have small data set, you won't be able to learn, uh, learn a deep neural network because you have a lot of parameters. If you have a lot of parameters, then you have problems. In case of statistical models, even if your model has a lot of parameters, you can usually compensate from that, for that by creating other structures of the models, and you can compensate for using small data sets. You can even there are possible situations when you can create a good Bayesian models, uh, which will have more parameters than measurement uh, than data points, and it will work. But it has certain uh, situations that uh, it's not always, but in certain situations it can be can be useful. Uh, statistical models provide you with uncertainty estimates. This is the main drawback of machine learning models, that machine learning models generally give you a number. And this number can be very useful, however, you cannot, you do not, uh, not have dynamic uncertainty information about that number. In case of statistical models, you can get not only a number, but, a st uh, uh, but changing levels of uncertainty regarding that number. So you can get some information that will locate you in appropriate sources. Of course, uh, additional bonus is transparency, because when you create a structuralized model that incorporates prior knowledge, that incorporates an aspect, this transparency is kind of natural. You know where everything is coming from. In case of black box system, you don't have that, that information. So you need more to put more trust in creation of statistical model, but the results can be uh, helpful in making responsible uh, decisions and be very tra transparent. So this is the uh, this is a good advantage. Also, it allows you to uh, investigate the influence of individual predictors, the features of your of your data that you have, because you that structuralized situation allows you to investigate how each of the features of each of signals that you, of your data influences the final prediction or classification problem. So, what we need to, we need to understand is that in certain aspect, machine learning, which can be very well suited, might need more data to solve the same problem as statistical models, especially in situation that data is scarce. On small data sets, statistical models can be usually better, especially if you can supplement them with expert knowledge. Uh, on the other hand, statistical models need to, for you to specify the interactions and influence of features on the prediction. So you need to create the model with, no, with awareness of what goes where. In machine learning, you don't have that limitation. You just put your you can put your data set and with certain preparations start with just a model that will use all the features and assign appropriate weights. This might be useful uh, or might be problematic, depending on the case. Uh, generally, with large data sets, high quality data sets, machine learning can provide you with a better classification or prediction than statistical model, but without uncertainty or with poor uncertainty estimates, and also uh, it's not that this is like significant difference. We are speaking about 1-2% differences, not like 50% and 90%. Of course, we are talking about well-prepared statistical model, well-prepared uh, machine learning models. We are not talking about like, oh, we start both with the box and or, or like we take a statistical model that we spent two years on that and we compare it with uh, default parameters neural network. That's, that is an unfair comparison. 
in case if with both models are well prepared then we can talk about fair comparison and machine learning if the data was uh, if you had enough data usually will be a tiny better in a in uh, numerical value of predictions uh, but might have problems with unexpected situations and general uncertainty Excuse me. I'm drinking coffee, but it's not helping. Um, either way, uh, machine learning is in ways very easy. It's not simple, but it's easy to start. It's hard to understand because mathematics behind machine learning can be deceptively uh, difficult. There is a lot of stuff that you really need to know what's going on. Also, a machine learning kind of appropriates certain areas in order to uh, uh, in, into them. For example, they there are ideas that statistical uh, models are generally uh, machine methods of machine learning. Or you can say, on the other hand, that uh, machine learning is a bastardized version of statistics. Either way, Machine learning has very vocal advocates because people love to speak about artificial intelligence and machine learning fits for that. And generally, when you are uh, speaking about machine learning, you have there was uh, inter some interesting opinion pieces that it's more alchemy than science because there is an aura of mysticism around machine learning, and certain people like just like propagate, "Oh, machine learning is amazing and it magically solves all your problems." Uh, Statistical models do not have such uh, vocal proponents, but uh, and usually requires a lot more work to make. Excuse me. Uh, a lot requires a lot of more work in order to be operating. But uh, this uh, can be beneficial in the long run, uh, especially in certain cases. Uh, for larger data sets, there are, might be problems with statistical models uh, because uh, Monte Carlo computation might become difficult with large data sets. We'll talk about uh, that later. Uh, and that's why uh, we just sometimes discuss our data reduction for larger data sets, which has all its own series of issues. We won't be addressing now. So. When do we want to use statistical models? First of all, in situations when uncertainty is important or signal to noise ratio is rather small. So situations where data is being uh, wh when our our data is very noisy or it's very difficult to measure. In such situation, uh, we are unable to use machine learning models and we want to get as much as our, our data and our knowledge as possible. Also, when we do not have perfect training data, because generally in statistical models we do not discuss training and testing data because the idea is something different. We want to learn about a process as much as possible with certain levels of generalization and we do not just compare it with a different, da uh, uh, different data set because it's like remove not using all the information that you can have for, uh, for preparation of model. Uh, if we want to uh, investigate particular relationships between variables, either causal or correlational, statistical models are very, very good for that. When we have good reasons to suspect, suspect additivity, between uh, uh, variables, that the effects are kind of independent, they're just coming together. Also, statistical models are very useful uh, because they are very simple to incorporate. In smaller samples, when uh, we just don't have a lot of data, and unfortunately, in technical problems, we really do not have a lot of data. We have a lot of data for images and texts and uh, uh, audio, but for example, from technical situation like measurements of uh, faulty installations in order to create a fault detection systems, or measurements from ma manufacturing problems, this is not that good situation. We have a uh, lot of data from non-representative periods. For example, people decided, oh, we will give you measurements from last three months, but last three months nothing spectacular happens, and we want to have a model that will allow to compensate for that. So that's the problem with, with data sets that are incomplete or, uh, or just small. 
and finally interpretability which is a very important aspect that is currently being a topic of a lot of discussion in the world because interpretability for example gives you such situation that if you are not given a bank loan you can learn how why did you not get that bank loan because that decision was being made by a, the decision support system that said you no, you don't getting a bank loan and that came from that your information that you provided them are certain predictors of bad credit behavior for example and you want to get that information back and now the pressure on from European Committee and uh, European Parliament is that all models especially in the economic sector but probably to be extended also must be interpretable and if those words are interpretable then we have a lot of advantages to use that situation so interpretability focuses us to use statistical models on the other hand machine learning was of course uh, very good in sep uh, inverse situation when signal and noise ratio is large signal to noise ratio is large and there's a little randomness in the process so images sound text those things are very uh, good well suited for machine learning because they have significant structure that even disturbances that we have we have noises that are significantly different from uh, from speech when we have uh, uh, blurry images when we still have a image structure when we have a little random uh, when we have uh, text that is just uh, then machine learning can work of course it's also not that it's uh, always uh, good you might have uh, heard of situations like recent months that some people created uh, uh, they replicated the idea from CSI TV shows that you can uh, increase the uh, size of the pixelated image and you can uh, just sharpen it to become a uh, uh, clear image however the most popular one was uh, used on strongly uh, bi biased data sets of mostly white people and it's uh, whitened all the black people that were uh, that were bl uh, pixelated for the most notable cause was a uh, picture of Obama that there was pixelated Obama that came white out of the uh, out of the model and uh, also like there was an issue on Twitter that uh, <coughs> cropped images were always centered on white people and not on black people so that has problems with training data in machine learning because training data in machine learning really if it's relatively unlimited or is very voluminous and representative it's a very good situation we have high quality representative large data sets go with machine learning it will work it will give you results you might not understand the process but you get the results the results are often, uh, often very, uh, uh, enough however if the data set is non-representative there are issues there are issues that uh, cannot be easily fixed by using additional information outside of for example regarding distribution of probabilities of certain events in statistical models you can uh, compensate for having for example a single case of uh, certain situation in your data sets and which is much more popular in the entire population but if you have good unlimited data sets or relatively unlimited machine learning is okay and relatively unlimited is not something that's not, not happening facebook twitter uh, all social media transfer such big amounts of data that everything is uh, doable in google you have billions of images all those things are really available and without uh, problems. So those are situations that you have lots of text for text recognition. Everything is go. Uh, everything is available. Uh, the most important thing for machine learning, if prediction or classification, so a numeric result, is the most important aspect, then machine learning is for you. Because if you are not interested in uncertainty, then machine learning usually will, will be more computationally efficient and it will be more computation uh, and uh, it will gi might give you slightly better results especially if you expect
complicated relationships, mostly uh, strongly nonlinear un or unpredictable ones. Then machine learning is okay. With huge sample, you can do a lot. If you are not interested of where is what everything is coming from, and usually in many studios you are not, black when black box is acceptable, then machine learning is great. So my point is not saying that statistical models will can replace machine learning. It can't. But machine learning cannot re replace statistical models. There are different tools. We'll focus on one. Machine learning you will have it next semester and give you certain complete aspects of bo both sides of data science that you can use. And we will focus on Bayesian statistical modeling. There are two ways of doing statistical models. One is uh, frequency uh, statistics, more classical results, uh, which uh, have some issues maybe we'll touch on the next lecture, and Bayesian approach, which generally has three essential steps. First of all, in Bayesian model, we create a full probability model, a model that corresponds to how quantities of interest are generating our data. In such situation, having such model, we have many advantages. For example, possibility of gener generating fake data. But having such model that creates the relationship between those uh, two things is uh, uh, a main step. Then you add the observed data. Our model is based on our assumptions. Data shapes our model, shapes it, allows us is, is to refine our probability predictions, and then using posterior distribution, so join of our prior knowledge and our data, we can evaluate that model and check it. And this we can repeat by modifying our model. So this is the main idea of Bayesian statistical modeling. But do you have any other questions regarding the uh, comparison between machine learning and statistical modeling? Well, maybe because we can now make a short break in the flow and continue in a moment. And I can answer some questions. I see that uh, one of the comments of uh, sound being better now, the uh, now was uh, uh, removed. So I'm wondering if sound is again wrong or something. Are any questions? Everything is clear at the moment. I give you a minute uh, or 30 seconds and we can continue in a moment. Yes, sound is bad again or yes, no questions. I've set the delay to minimum, but I think that it's it can be a bit large. Okay. Well, this is a problem I really cannot investigate now, uh, especially with all those delays. I've dropped the volume of the, mi uh, of the mic as much as really possible. I'm not sure that I can modify it more in the OBS. If it's still hearable, it's, th it's okay or it's not okay?
I know that delays are different for different people. Like I've dropped a uh, volume for all the uh, drop for uh, I've the drop volume for all both software and uh, hardware. But like, can you hear me now? Or there is still noise? Or so what? The main problem is that I should get here. I'm hearing what I'm saying to the mic, but I don't see any noise. So that's that's the main problem, that I cannot get the feedback by myself. Okay. And any questions besides sound? nothing okay uh, then let's go to uh, continuation so we started with three steps of Bayesian statistical modeling generally Bayesian statistics are it's an entire paradigm paradigm of uh, thinking about probability thinking about models thinking about uh, general inference because in case of classical statistics also called frequent statistics we think about the situation that the day there is a fixed reality a model or an object an object that is generating our data which is fixed it has fixed parameters that are once set in stone and the idea of frequent statistics is that the data that we uh, observe is one of the possible situations that could arise by our fixed parameter system and general randomness of the universe. So there is a system, a fixed system, and its uh, data is being uh, and the data is uncertain. On the other hand, in Bayesian paradigm, we have fixed data because we've obtained the data. The data won't change. This is something that we can, our experiment was conducted or our observation were made. We have certain series of data points and from those data points we can <coughs> uh, create the uh, we can create uh, we can create our inferences and because of that because of only the data that we have we have uncertainty about the parameters of the mo of the object the object that generated the data generated this data because it has uns uh, but from the data we can only learn to certain extent what the parameters of the model were so we just don't know what it is. So we as can assign probability that represents how much we, let's say, believe the parameters has a value. So we can assign uh, the distribution that, with, OK, from the data, we can infer that it's most probable that the parameters is in this range. But there's certain probability that's larger, certain probability that's smaller. So we get probability distribution of the parameter value. How our data gives us information about the probability of the, uh, of the system. Second uh, aspect in the, the difference between Bayesian and Frequentist paradigm is prior knowledge. In the case of Frequentist models, we have only data. We have data and this data gives us possibility of uh, finding the uh, finding the parameters from or we can only from the data. In the case of Bayesian system, we have prior knowledge. We know, for example, what is the probability. For example, we can inc include in knowledge that certain values cannot be negative, or we can include the val uh, information that they cannot exceed certain certain levels. For example temperature is not real number it's a number that is contained between 
uh, zero Kelvin and uh, let's say 6,000 Kelvin when it's the temperature of the sun. <coughs> we cannot have m higher temperatures or lower than that. And what we do in uh, Bayesian models, we can incorporate the knowledge that we can get from experts. We can get uh, knowledge that uh, we can get from uh, knowledge about phenomena or we can get knowledge from previous experiments that is gave us previous probability distribution about parameters we can then incorporate to that and introduce new data so that is why Bayesian paradigm is so attractive because it can additively uh, you can recursively add, add new data and create a new probability distribution of parameters of interest because generally in Bayesian models everything has a probability distribution so data has probability distributions because uh, we have probably uh, because that we have under we have data actual data and the measurement error so we have the measurement process so we come from the quantities of interest those quantities of interest are being uh, some kind of disturbed during the measurement process this disturb uh, uh, disturbance means like for example our sensors are noisy or it can be more systematic that we got into the saturation of sensors and that quantity that we are measuring with our unperfect non-perfect way still is kind of representative from the values from the system so generally everything has a probability distribution our model parameters have probability distribution our data have probability distributions our noises have probability distributions everything has the same distribution and because of that everything fits together from similar building blocks that can be created. and also Bayesian statistics allows you to generally create any model from those principles from those building blocks of probabilities in classical statistics you have for example statistical tests you have uh, certain estimators that are biased and unbiased asymptotically unbiased which you have properly you need to properly select in case of Bayesian statistics, you just have probability distributions that you have to join in the right way in order to make inference. Mine advantage and reason why Bayesian statistics are popular and a topic of discussion is that because they work. They mine disadvantages that was from the holding them for many years were two. One was philosophical, which we won't be discussing too much, that we are incorporating belief and uh, assigned probabilities and we are not fully objective. Uh, and uh, the second one is computation, because from classical results we had analytical results. Everything we could uh, be relatively easy computed using analytical formulas. In Bayesian reality it's not possible. Bayesian models require, in, on an analytical point of view, computation of multiple integrals and stuff like that. So this is the problematic situation. It was solved by introduction of modern computational methods. However, generally, Bayesian methods through history were being developed multiple times. They were based of many practical applications. There's a very interesting book called The Theory That Would Not Die. This is a popular science book that you can, for example, get on Audible for one month. It's an audio book, but uh, if, uh, uh, if you don't have an account on Audible, you can create one, you get one month free, and you can listen for free. And this book that describes history, how based in theory, which was actually developed by Laplace, not by Be Thomas Bayes. Thomas Bayes was a priest that had some very abstract ideas about probability. Practical computation was created by Simon Laplace, known from Laplace transform, for example. Uh, the Bayesian methods allow us uh, were be, uh, being met with much difficulties from uh, classical st statisticians who were, let's say, fighting those methodologies and uh, there was a lot of controversies about those beliefs, about uh, computational issues, however, 
practical results from Bayesian theory, especially in the 20th century, were such strongly uh, in favor of using those methods in comparison to uh, classical ones, it's uh, that it just the, the theory just became more and more widely accepted, at least by, uh, by applied scientists or applied users. For example, Bayesian theory was used by Turing in order to create, uh, uh, to break Enigma codes and for the additional German codes, using first computers actually that were later destroyed after the war. And uh, there was uh, the Bayesian methods allowed us uh, allowed for search uh, optimizing search for lost nuclear bombs that fell out of the of planes. Uh, Bayesian methods very easily find found their way into use, for example, in the um, insurance business, because uh, probabilistic models using insurances even in the early f early forties and fifties used Bayesian methods because they allowed in order to compute probabilities of events that did not happen. That the main problem in frequentist statistics is that you could not assign a probability for something that has not happened before. In case of Bayesian statistics, you can assign such probabilities by uh, using probab certain probability distribution expert knowledge. That's why you can be prepared. That's wh why you could use Bayesian methods to search for lost nuclear bomb, because despite the fact that did not, it did not happen before, you can still assign probabilities for that. So, I strongly recommend reading that book if someone is at least in somewhat interested in history of science, because it's fascinating history of really methods being. Uh, Theoretical method being practically used and finding up, uh, finding approval only by ap its application. Usually theories are like uh, rise from the theoretical background that it's a claim. Then later theory is uh, uh, is uh, so interesting for people that they validate it from to create some experiments to validate. In case of Bayesian statistics, everyone was against it from the beginning. The theory wasn't liked, at least by most of people, but because of uh, uh, some people were still championing for it and showing multiple and multiple applications that work and solve problems that were absolutely not solvable by classical methods, then Bayesian methods become uh, accepted. The, what is interesting is that actually Bayesian applications did not find its way yet widely to the technical sciences. In technical sciences, we really rarely consider ourselves with probabilities and uncertainties, which is a big mistake, in my opinion. However, the main fields which used Bayesian statistics and developed a lot of Bayesian are social sciences. Social sciences are not treated seriously in Poland, for example, or generally at AGH. However, Social science has a one big problem that it's great, uh, that uh, Bayesian statistics are great. Social science have bad data because social science rely a lot on surveys and surveys are based on people answering questions which they can lie, they can not answer, the sample might not be representative. It's very hard to find representative sample of people that will answer your questions they can be biased, and all those things are, you have limited data with very uh, uncertain results. And because of that, they have to be used methods that are able to compensate for that. And that's why a lot of people that needed to solve those issues reached for Bayesian methods, and they've developed them. Uh, for example, Professor Gelman is uh, working in Columbia University in so political science department, and he and his team created one of the most advanced probabilistic computation engines in the world, despite being located in social sciences. But they are, of course, uh, they have background in physics and mathematics, but they moved to social science because they solved, pro they found problems that they, they could solve and get the good results on them using Bayesian statistics. The same is from medicine and biology, where Still, cl classical frequencies results are still popular, but Bayesian methods are getting a big foothold. It's 
popular in experimental sciences where you can uh, use it to plan experiments that you want to conduct and uh, it's useful for diagnostics uh, for example creating a diagnostic models based on incomplete data because for example when you have process installation let's say a refinery you have one failure over multiple years you can get a lot of data for healthy operation you cannot get data for faulty operation and you because of that you cannot use machine learning model you need to create something that will get the expert knowledge to the system uh, and of course ba decision support systems because of as I said before ability to propagate the data uh, the uncertainty from the uh, from the data and from the model through the decision process so you can use it to estimate the costs of your decision so if a decision will be right what are benefits what are probable benefits and if a decision is wrong what will be the co actual cost of making that mistake so these are main fields of use in Bayesian application which can be extended to multiple multiple other problems in Bayesian data analytics we have certain concepts that we need to be familiar with, let's say a glossary of concepts that we will be considering. First of all, we have observables and unobservables. Observables are generally data that we are using. Those data are very, uh, uh, that can be noisy, but let's still we can get their values. Unobservables are parameters of the system, something that we need to infer to get their actual value. So. We have, uh, in notation, we consider parameters which will be usually uh, marked by Greek letter theta, data that will be marked by y, and predictions that will be marked y with a dash. So we predict the uh, values of data that we could measure. We have observational units, so we have groups of observations, for example, what we could measure in one, one observation, and we have variables, so certain individual values that we the concept of exchangeability, so a situation when the order how the measurements are being made does not make a difference in our inference, or order or uh, the uh, combination of them, or situation that one from the other does not are not correlated. The exchangeability is uh, one of the important aspects. We will talk about it later. Our models will be based usually on predictors or ex explanatory variables, which will be useful for uh, creating complicated models relating what we know, you know that what we want to know. We will be using hierarchical modeling. And hierarchical modeling is a very powerful tool that allows us to compensate for small data sets and non-homogeneity of, grou of our groups. So for example, when we have multiple people, uh, depending on the group, we could use certain character on our data set in order to get a better predictions on our entire population, taking the, into the, uh, taking the heterogeneity of the population into the consideration. Uh, finally, we discuss utility distributions, so we know how our probability distributions uh, are being propagated by some kind of utility functions allowing us to make better decisions later. Let's start with a bit of math, let's say ma math repertory, something that you should already know, that is Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule comes from a classical result on the joint probability which could you could decipher, for example, from the Venn diagram, so the classical diagram of uh, two uh, wheels overlapping each other, that a joint probability of two events is the probability of one of them and probability of the other one, multiple probability of the other one, uh, conditional on happening the first one. So generally, we want to have a one part. Uh, we want to have a common part of one event and the other that is overlapping that one. With 
relatively basic transformation, we can see that this relationship can be inverted. So, while probability of theta and y equals probability of theta uh, times probability of y conditional on theta is also equal to probability of y times probability of theta conditional on y. So we can get both sides of the equation just inverted with each other. So getting them together, we can easily see that probability of theta depending on y is the joint probability divided by probability of y. And replacing the joint with the probability of uh, uh, with the probability of uh, the probability of from the joint, uh, joint probability theorem, we get the base rule. And what is important in this case is that for all values of theta, probabilities of y is probability of theta times probability of y conditional on theta. So for all possible values of theta, we can get y from this. So this is base rule. Base rule that in practice is used mostly in the numerator. Because denominator, oh, sorry, the denominator here is a number independent on theta because all the theta values are being summed out of it. So the only part that is dependent on theta is the numerator. So that's why we focus on the numerator and we get the classical base rule that posterior probability is proportional to the prior probability. So our knowledge about parameter theta and its distribution times the probability of our data conditional on theta, so so-called likelihood. So how generally likelihood says us this knowing these values of parameters, how our data fit the model that we have. The model that we have is encoded in the likelihood. This is the value knowledge about what we have about what we know about parameters. This is the model dependent on the parameters and how well data fit the model. So likelihood corresponds to something that, for example, from automatic control, we could consider as performance indicator. So the difference between some kind of measure of the difference between model prediction and observed data. So probability of theta dependent uh, conditional on our measurements is the multiplication. So the posterior is mo is proportional. So it's a, it, this would be equality if the appropriate constant would be given here as multiplication is to prior distribution. So our previous knowledge and our and how uh, relationship how data well fits our model. However quoting Michael Betancourt, remember that using Bayes' theorem does not make you Bayesian. Quantifying uncertainty with probability makes you Bayesian. Bayesian uh, statistics is all about uncertainty. Bayes' theorem is a basics that we can use it, but most important is probability distributions. Everywhere probability distributions which gives us uncertainty. So, we'll finish today's lecture with a uh, very nice example that is f even funnier for, uh, for Polish uh, readers that is in uh, Bayesian Data Analytics 3 about uh, typos. Because uh, uh, German and colleagues have used the Google database of words relative probabilities and considered the aspect of writing something different instead of random. So uh, generally they wanted to find a pro how probable was that someone accidentally dropped an N from random and result with random. From then it was a random word. Uh, we of course know that it's not random. And they were actually very puzzled that the relative frequency of random was much higher than they expected. They thought that it's just a simple typo because they wanted to make an example related to what random. And they found out that this is a city in Poland. 
actually, apparently they uh, the fame of Radom was for them about f uh, flying in schools and not about certain lady and certain free bottles of Mieszko Trzy Cytryny. Uh, but this is the... Uh, they thought Radom... They thought the Radom does not exist. Well, some people also would like the Radom not to exist, but we were, are where we are. And generally, they started with a very simplified model that there are possible three worlds, random, radon, and radom, with our, our favorite radom. And, of course, they wanted to know the probability, how it is possible that if someone spelled radom, they really wanted to spell radom and not random. Uh, so they uh, created the, uh, uh, the, uh, the initial model. They assigned the probabilities. PT, that's what those, those are relative probabilities of writing certain words, got from Google search results. Then they assigned the probability, what, what the probabilities of why, uh, the likelihood of rad uh, radom, uh, considering that it was our uh, intended word, or the word random was intended word. And they, of course, divided it by all possible options. The prior distribution they've got from Google Spellcheck model, where they see that random, radon, and radon have their own frequencies. Radom is, in English language, still a bit unpopular, but relatively close to this. And they got likelihood by using, again, a uh, Google Spellcheck model. We decided to them that, depending on uh, uh, rad uh, radom would be uh, uh, probability of being it random is this one, probability of radom is this one, and probability of that radom expecting radom is this one. So, using this information, we could compute, pre uh, perform appropriate multiplication. So, getting the computing denominators, uh, numerators of all options, we get certain values, of course, the likelihood of radon is the smallest one. Probability of radon was strongly increased of that, and using normalization factors, so we, d again, divided it by all the values here, so that we summed the probabilities, or each of those probabilities here. So we divide this numerator by sum of all those as a denominator, this is our normalizing factor, we got actual probabilities of intended word in this column being ra uh, obs if observed word was random. So from this information is uh, for the Google project model and the simplifying assumptions, the model stated that is two-thirds of the examples, or, or two two, in a, with two-thirds of confidence, people that wrote Radom really wanted to write Radom. However, because it's still English language and English la uh, language database, there is a third probability that was a typo that someone dropped them and So that's how we create the Bayesian model. We, we have prior information, so how, the, using relative frequencies, we get how the, the certain word was possible. Then, using the spell check model, we got the likelihood. So, how actually probable such typos are, uh, are possible. And then, by multiplication and normalization, we get the direct values. So, this is all I wanted to say today uh, regarding the topic. So, we just marked the territory. We generally discussed what is the difference between statistical model and uh, machine learning, and we uh, focused, uh, and then we started a bit of Bayesian terminology and uh, very simple example of Bayesian uh, competition. Are there any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Do you want to anything else to know about what we've talked today? The lectures will be available later today. Uh, I've, well, generally they are, but like I've uh, did the minor modifications that I will just push in a moment. Any questions? I'll just give you a minute for, for those questions to 
compensate for delay. If no questions, of course, then goodbye. And we'll finish this transmission for today. Okay, if there are no questions, thank you very much for your attention. To all of you that were here, which is consisted of, at the moment, 13 people, uh, thank you very much and see you during classes on next week. Uh, as a reminder, because all people were already covered, there will be no fr Friday afternoon group. This is an artifact from the last year. Uh, the only gr uh, laboratory groups that are here uh, are uh, available are those two on Friday and one on Wednesday. Okay, thank you very much and have a nice weekend. <laughs>